Saturday, Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom Lach. Shall we pray in Hebrew? If you don't understand Hebrew, just say Amen. It's good enough for King David, it's good enough for us. Avinu Markenu, Hanak Norasim Lavo Bifnecha Bechazdecha. Anna Adonai Tishpochro Chechecha Aleno. Tenla no Messer Mimcha. Ari de Yeshua Adon Midvarecha. Ten lano aba, a humada hamaretz, lo raklish moa, of a gam can la sot, lefima shekatu bedreha. The shem she Yeshua hamashiak, Adonenu, go lehenu betzit katenu. Amen. You want me to tell you what I said? I don't know, I, I memorized it by rote. <laughs> Yeah, the last days are like birth pangs. They get increasingly intense. And like anything else, strike the leaders, strike the shepherds, the sheep will scatter. Leaders are going to come under increasing pressure in the last days. One of the reasons that godly pastors and godly preachers I know are having such difficult times in various aspects of their lives. It's God grooming them for the future. They're going to have to be able to provide the guidance and the example for other people. And you can't lead people through a difficult stretch of turf where you haven't been yourself. Yet God will raise up leaders, and one of the ways he's going to train these leaders is to let them go through difficult trials. Teach them how to persevere in those trials. And then they will be his instruments to be able to guide and encourage others through those trials the way Moses did, etc. Now I use the term persevere for a reason. Most of us don't understand what persevere actually means in Greek. We give it a wrong definition when we think of to persevere, perseverance. What John Paul Jones is in American military history, and it's quite a thing, this American naval commander was actually born in Scotland in the American Revolution. <laughs> he knew how to fight the British Navy because he was in it. <laughs> you know, like that. But uh, the British equivalent is Lord Nelson, Lord Nelson and his ship HMS Victory. And there's a joke that's told in Britain to naval cadets, people who are training to be naval officers in the Royal Navy. He said, Lord Nelson was on the HMS Victory, and um, the sailor who was up with the periscope in the crow's nest saw one of Napoleon's ships, a brigantine, approaching at a distance. And he said, Lord Nelson, French ship astern, brigantine. Nelson said to his aide, sound general quarters, order everyone to their battle stations, and bring me my red cape. And so they did battle with the French brigantine, and they sunk it. The next day, the chap up in the crow's nest with the periscope sees two French brigantines. He says, Lord Nelson, ship ahoy, two French brigantines off the starboard bow. And Nelson says to his aide, sound general quarters, battle stations, and bring me my red cape. And he sinks two of them. The next day, same thing happens. Only the sailor up in the clothes nest says, ship ahoy, there's three French brigantines off the starboard bow. And Nelson says to his aide, sound general quarters, battle stations, and bring me my red cape. Well, he does battle successfully and sinks all three of them. His aide asks him, may I ask you, Admiral, why is it every time you order battle stations you say to bring your red cape? And he says, because if I get wounded in battle, I don't want the men to be demoralized or to be dispirited. I want them to be able to look upon me as a source of encouragement and steadfastness in the midst of the battle. If I'm bleeding, I don't want them to see the blood. Okay. Well, the next day, 
sailor who was with the periscope up in the crow's nest said, Ship ahoy, there's a whole squadron of French brigantines off the starboard bow. And Lord Nelson said, Battle stations, sound general quarters, bring me my red cape and my yellow riding breeches. <laughs> Things get worse before they get better. Things get worse before they get better. Leaders are only ordinary people. There is a little monument next to a subway station in Queens in my native New York. And it's a quote by an American admiral from the Second World War called Admiral Halsey, nicknamed Bulls Halsey. That was his nickname. And on this little monument, it says, there are no heroes. There are no heroic men. The men we call heroes are ordinary men in extraordinary circumstances. <laughs> well, that's all it is. Ordinary men in extraordinary circumstances. These people may stand out for what they did under extraordinary circumstances, but the fact of the matter is many people would have behaved heroically under those circumstances. If you think you're going to die anyway, what's the difference? You may as well go down, take some of them with you or whatever. You know, if you think it's over, the game is over. Well, that, what's what, nothing to lose. These are just ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances. Well, it's no different in the church in the last days. Persevere. What do we mean by persevere? And what does God mean by persevere? Here begins the complication. Here begins the problem. I'll just write it in Latin letters. Hoopamoni. Hoopamoni is perseverance. But it doesn't mean in Greek exactly what it does in English. Proskoteritis. is closer to what it means in English. Steadfastness. Steadfastness. When we say perseverance, most people think it means steadfastness, being steadfast. That's not the meaning of hupomony. That's the meaning of proskateresis. What then is the meaning of hupomony? Hearken. Hearken. Listen and act upon what you hear. Remember, faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. Hearken, listen. This is what we got to do. Hoopamoni is walking in the Spirit, listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. The first and foremost way God speaks to us by His Spirit is with His Word, inspired by the Spirit. And anything else God tells us to do will be based on the Scripture. <laughs> Thank you.
<laughs> la briut. Proskatharisis. Steadfastness comes from hearkening. Hearkening. Walk in the spirit. You will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. <laughs> you stop walking in the spirit, the devil knows we're going to sin anyway. That's all he's got to do is get us in the flesh. It's only, it's only a matter of time unless we get things right. We must hearken. We must practice this idea of walking with Jesus daily. I mean, people sing about it. It's a nice song and everything. He walks with me and he talks with me. It's because it sounds like a nice jingle or something. People sing it. No, there's theology in that song, that hymn. There's theology. David talks about meditating upon thy word, you know. Hearkening. Hearkening. I was a friend of a my wife really knew him well because they could speak to each other in Romanian. My Romanian is not that good, but it was my wife's mother tongue. There was a Romanian Jew who was persecuted first by the Nazis and then by the communists. Richard Wormbrand, founder of Voice of the Martyrs, and he was the author of the book Tortured for Christ. He was 14 years in a communist prison, as was his wife. It was terrible what Ceausescu did to him. And of course, the minute Ceausescu was put against the wall and shot, I wouldn't want to be in that man's shoes for anybody. Nonetheless, I knew Richard Wormbrand. And I knew people who knew him in Romania. Some of my wife's family knew him in Romania before he was saved from the Romanian Jewish community. He and his wife Sabina were both Jewish, and they were in the same Jewish community as my wife's family. My wife was a believer, and we knew him from Israel, and I knew people who knew him in America. But anyway... He was once, and I used to hear, whenever he was speaking, we used to stop our own meetings on Saturday. That's like Sunday, but this was Saturday, is worship day. And we'd all go just to hear him speak. The whole congregation would just go to hear him. And I remember he was asked one time, when you were in prison for 14 years and facing the torture and all these terrible things were happening, which one of the promises of Jesus sustained you or kept you going. And he said, I reached a point, and anyone in that situation will reach a point where none of the promises of Jesus will keep you going. He said, Jesus will keep you going. Now that does not invalidate the promises. We can hold fast to the promises of God and all that stuff. That's all true. But if someone is in severe trial or under heavy persecution, <laughs> you're not going to be steadfast unless you hearken. You will never be steadfast unless you hearken. That is why in the last days, particularly in the book of Revelation, the emphasis is never on, or not much on, poskatharesis. The emphasis on on hearkening, hearkening. You know, I wait for my wife for a couple of weeks. And, you know, fortunately, I'm older now, and there's not as much testosterone as there used to be. But uh, no, I've never had an affair, and I don't subscribe to internet porn sites or anything. But uh, stuff goes through your head. My old lady knows I don't fool around. As you can see for yourself, I couldn't get a date in a woman's house of detention anyway. <laughs> Why is it that I never did anything when I was away from my wife for work and for ministry? Why? <laughs> Hearkening. <laughs> you really going to do that? You want to see what that cost? I just think of him being nailed to the cross to pay for what I was contemplating doing. <laughs> being nailed to the cross to pay for what I was... No. Uh, you didn't just die for all, 
all of us. He died for each of us. <laughs> you got to hearken. You got to hearken. Left to myself, I guarantee you, I would have. <laughs> and I've, I've had opportunities, you know. I, I, when I was a bit younger, anyway, you get these women with unsaved husbands, and they hear you preach, and they think you're stunning. You can tell they're getting weird and everything, you know. <laughs> kind of gives you the creeps, but. <laughs> But you have to smile and be nice because you're a preacher. <laughs> I've, uh, you want me to fix you up with my friend Henry? He's a dentist in Chicago. <laughs> it's only hearkening. Now let's understand hearkening. Look with me, please, to the book of Revelation. Chapter 13. When the Antichrist comes, things are going to be extremely, extremely intense. This term, perseverance of the saints, only occurs in the book of Revelation and only in reference to this particular time. Verse 7, and it was given to him, that Antichrist, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. Okay. Uh, and all who dwell on the earth will worship him, everyone whose name was not written in the, from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone... Kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. Here is the perseverance of and the faith of the saints. Perseverance goes hand in hand with faith. Perseverance goes hand in hand with faith. Now, if you understood or have ever heard our past teaching on faith, the Greek word pistes. And the Hebrew word, emunah, we get the word amen. In both Greek and in Hebrew, faith and faithfulness are the same word. We make a distinction in English. God's word does not make that distinction. We're saved by grace through faith? Yes, it's grace. And we accept it by faith, that is by trust. But we are saved by grace through faithfulness. You must be faithful to him who saved you. As he was faithful to us. Faithful to Jesus. The righteous shall live by faith. Trust, yes. But the righteous shall live by faithfulness. Scripture does not make a distinction between faith and faithfulness. If someone's faith is real, they will be faithful. This is, in large part, what the epistle of James is talking about. Faith without works is dead. Well, faithfulness without works is dead. If you're faithful, you're going to be acting on what you, you're trusting in. <laughs> we make this distinction in the English language that is not to be found either in Greek or in Hebrew. Faith and faithfulness are essentially the same. Now, perseverance always goes hand in hand with faith, meaning not only trust, but faithfulness. 
I trust you, so I'm going to be faithful to you. <laughs> I'm going to be faithful to you, Jesus, because I trust you. I'm going to act on it. I will persevere, that is, I will hearken. That's the meaning. Now, when we look at the book of Revelation, when the horsemen are unleashed with the seals, we see the first one is the Antichrist imitating Christ. He comes on a white horse, doesn't he? Just as Jesus comes on a white horse later on after the vile judgments. Antichrist comes before Christ and tries to counterfeit him, tries to look like him. Okay. You've got the second seal, the war, the third seal, the famine, the fourth seal is death, but then the fifth seal is the martyrdom. That is great tribulation. That's what happens. Okay. It's at that point the perseverance of the saints becomes crucial to survival. What does that mean? Does it mean steadfastness? Steadfastness will be a byproduct of perseverance, of hearkening. If we're not hearkening, there'll be no steadfastness. The scriptures do not put the emphasis on steadfastness for a reason. The reason is, if you have Perseverance, if you are hearkening, steadfastness will be the automatic result, okay? Stepping on the accelerator, the vehicle's going to move. It puts the emphasis on hearkening. If you hearken, steadfastness will be the automatic result. It is a wrong view to say we have to concentrate on being steadfast, to redefine perseverance as being steadfast. We just have to hold on and continue to be faithful and continue to believe. You can believe and you can try to hold on, but the pressures of life and certainly the pressures the church will face at this hour will break your steadfastness unless you are hearkening. What it cannot break is the hearkening. But if you think hearkening is just the steadfastness, just the hanging on, no, it's not going to work. It's not good enough to hold on to Jesus. If you're really holding on to him, you're going to listen to what he's saying. Now remember, he's not going to let us go anywhere. That not only he's going to be with us, even in an MRI tube, and I hate those things. My nose never itches except when I'm in an MRI tube. <laughs> I was never claustrophobic in my life until I went into an MRI tube. He's even with us in an MRI tube. And I wouldn't go on that thing for anybody if I didn't have to. Well... Not only is he not going to let us go anywhere, he's not going to be with us. He's not going to let us go anywhere. He hasn't already been himself. <laughs> That's quite a thing. I got this. I've been here before. I know what's going to happen, and I know what to do. Trust me. Listen to me. Do what I tell you. That works. This, oh, Jesus, help me. To say what I That's not going to work. But it's a process that we need to grow into. But before we talk about that, let's look again at the aftermath of this. Chapter 14 of Revelation, please. Verse 11. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And now, Tawe, now, as we said yesterday, I'm sorry, as we said, yeah, uh, Wednesday. And those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives 
the mark of his name. Okay. Verse 12, here is the hoopamony of the saints who keep the commandments of Jesus and their faith in Jesus and the commandments of God. You see the relationship once again between faith and hoopamony, between peace days and hoopamony, peace don't and hoopamony. The two go hand in hand. Why do they keep the commandments of God? Why do they remain faithful to Jesus? Because they are hearkening. Because they are hearkening. If we are not hearkening, we are not going to keep his commandments. If we are not hearkening, we're not going to be faithful, and our faith will fail us. This idea, we just have to hold on to Jesus and trust him. The good shepherd carries the lambs. That is true to a degree for a newly saved person or a child. That is true to a degree for a newly saved person or a child. For the rest of us, holding on to him is necessary, but that's not going to do it. It's listening to him. Just think of teaching somebody how to swim when they're a little kid and they're afraid of water. Maybe they had a traumatic experience and they fell into the swimming pool and had to get rescued and now they're afraid to go swimming and you're trying to teach them to swim so you have a swimming instructor and the kid is just holding on to the swimming instructor. That kid's never going to learn to swim by holding on to the instructor. You've got to listen to the instructor. There's a process involved. That process is the perseverance of the saints. Now, I'm not downplaying steadfastness. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 58. The resurrection chapter. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Yet we're told to be steadfast. We're told to be steadfast. But being steadfast is not achieved by trying to be steadfast. Being steadfast is achieved by hearkening, by persevering. Does everybody understand the difference between the two? Again, there's a translation problem when you put these biblical languages into English. Now, as we saw in Revelation 14, uh, verse 12, here is the perseverance of the saints. The Calvinistic redefinition of perseverance of the saints from Bezos Tulip meaning unconditional, once saved, always saved, is not what that term means. That term is only found in Revelation chapters 13 and 14, and it has nothing whatsoever to do with unconditional, once saved, always saved. It is a complete nonsense invention of the Calvinists to say it does. That's not what the term means. They cannot show you a single other place in Scripture where the term perseverance of the saints even occurs. And in the context, it's not talking about unconditional, once saved, always saved. You are once saved, always saved if you are steadfast. And you are steadfast if you hearken. Hearken. It's like anything, temptation. <laughs> the voice you listen to is the one that's going to win the fight, isn't it? So the voice we listen to is the one that's going to win the fight. Well, listen. Look with me, please, if you will, to Romans 8, 25. How do we get ready to face the last days to be steadfast, to persevere in faith and in faithfulness? Let's begin by looking. Romans chapter 8, verse 25. 
But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. If we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, how do you hope for something you can't see with perseverance? Through a relationship with Jesus. Steadfastness is the result of the relationship. Perseverance is the relationship. Hearkening. Don't worry. I'm here. I've got you. We're going to do this. Everything is set. Don't worry about the problems. I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt. You can't see it, but you have a blessed hope. You can't see it, but persevere. In other words, I'm just believing the Lord, hallelujah. No, no, no. I'm walking with the Lord. He sees me through day to day, and I know he's not going to fail me. Because he doesn't fail me day to day. He's not going to fail me in times of trial or temptation. And he's not going to fail me in the last days. You understand? That is the emphasis. This idea of holding on to being steadfast. There is nothing more pathetic than what social psychologists define as functional or, or cognitive dissonance. That's a better term. Cognitive dissonance. You've got these wacko cults like the Jehovah's Witness. They just keep resetting the date and holding on to something that is consistently proved to be bogus. But they still hold on to it. They're steadfast. Oh, they're very steadfast, aren't they? They're quite steadfast. It's a lot of rubbish, but they're steadfast. There were a group of believers from the north of England. You want to talk about nuts. They were called the shakers. And they would prophesy and everything, and they would begin to have this, this Toronto Pensacola. This was not new. Other groups did this, including these shakers. They'd mount it and shake, and they'd vibrate on the floor and have all these prophecies and stuff like this. And the largest number of them came to upstate New York, near Albany, to a place called Colony. Today, the airport of Albany, New York, was built on where their settlement was. Up until a few years ago, there was two of them left. Still holding on to these prophecies that went back 150 years, still believing it. And they were, they were old people. From some mother Crandall, that was some mother something that was from England. She had these prophecies. They were holding on to it. Didn't happen. Did they persevere? No. If they were persevering, they would have knew it was all rubbish. But they were steadfast. <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses are steadfast. Many people are steadfast. You want to talk about nonsense. Having rejected the true Messiah, the rabbis told the Jewish people, Rabbi Akiva told them Simon Bar Kokhba was the Messiah, got them driven out of their land for nearly 2,000 years in the second century. The rabbis told them Jacob Frank was the Messiah. The rabbis told them Shabbat Taisfi was the Messiah. The rabbis told them now that Menachem Schneerson, the Lubavitch rabbi, is the Messiah. There have been over 50 people who claimed to be the Messiah who had varying degrees of rabbinic support. But in the case of Bar Kokhba and in the case of Shabbat Taisvi and Jacob Frank, it was widespread rabbinic support. So you, see, you can't see, look, the rabbis told you this one, this one, this one, this one, and none of them were the Messiah. How come you still believe in these guys? They believe in that. There's a, there's a vigil at the grave of Menachem Schneerson in Queens, New York, because they think he's going to raise from the dead. Say to, so you think the Jewish Messiah is going to come and die and raise from the dead? Yeah, you're me too. <laughs> At least you got that right. But you got the wrong Messiah. 
But they, are they persevering? They think they are persevering. No. Prosthetiris is not hupomony. Now they are steadfast, but they're not hearkening. If they were hearkening, they would know Yeshua is the Messiah. Remember what Jesus said. If you believed Moses, you'd believe me also. The problem with unsaved Jews, particularly religious Jews, if you've not heard me say this, the problem with unbelieving Jews, especially the Orthodox, is not that they reject Yeshua, Jesus as the Messiah. That's not the problem. That's the result of the problem. The problem is not that they don't believe him. The problem is that they don't believe Moses. If they really believed the Torah, if they really believed the Tanakh, the Old Testament, they would know he's the Messiah, John chapter 5. Their problem is that they don't believe the Torah. They don't believe the Hebrew prophets. If they believed that, then they would know he's the Messiah. But having rejected that, they get this one and this one and this one, and one nut after another, one crackpot, one deceiver, who wrecks havoc. Some of them even deduce things that had genocidal consequences. But they persevere. No, they're not persevering. They're just steadfast. <laughs> if you're trying to be steadfast, your faith is going to fail you. Because if you're trying to be steadfast, your faith is in your ability to hang on. <laughs> But if you're hearkening, your faith is in his ability to hang on to you. <laughs> there is a big difference. There's a big difference. People who are steadfast, their faith is in what they imagine to be their ability to hang on to some belief or something like that. It's going to fail. Hearkening is a faith in his ability to hold on to us. Oh, yeah, we hold on to him. It's mutual. But unless he was holding us as well, <laughs> unless the initiative and the real source of strength was his, we're going to lose our grip. There's a big difference. Steadfastness must not be confused with hearkening. Okay. Perseverance is not steadfastness. Perseverance is not steadfastness. Steadfastness is not perseverance. It is the result of it, or a result of it. Everyone clear? Now, in the last days, it becomes very vital not only to understand this, but to practice it. Once again, Romans chapter 8, 25. If we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we will eagerly wait for it. One of two things are going to happen. Either the Lord is going to come for us collectively, or he's going to come for us individually. To be perfectly honest with you, not to in any way diminish anyone's hope in the rapture or anything, but the rapture and the resurrection are the same event. They're just two aspects of the same event, the parousia. The more I read the book of Revelation, the less unattractive the boneyard becomes. <laughs> I'm not so sure most of us are going to want to be here. When they can just check out from scurvy or something, you know? <laughs> well, let's look at this. Romans chapter 5, please. And not only this, but we also exult in our Philipses tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope, and hope does not disappoint, and all that stuff. 
Notice the focus is not on hearkening. It's on perseverance. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. The best way to train soldiers for combat is a live fire exercise. My son was in the Israeli army. In the Israeli army, for certain people going into what's known as Kavi combat units, there is something called Hahar Hanora, the terrible hill. It's in the Negev desert where the temperature in Fahrenheit is about 120 degrees, extremely dry. There is a medical rehydration clinic next to it because of the danger of heat stroke. Soldiers consume large amounts of water and salt tablets to prevent the heat stroke. You've got full battle kit and a rifle and a helmet in this heat, plus body armor. Heavy, but in that heat, this hill has got barbed wire that cuts, and it will give you an electric shock. And then they set off by remote control quarrying gas canisters underneath it, and these things are going up the hill of that heat. They won't give you a gas mask. You gotta cough your way up. <laughs> I mean, they control the concentration of it so as not to do pulmonary damage, but it certainly irritates, it causes tears and coughing in this. And on top are drill instructors dressed like Muslim terrorists <laughs> with AK-47s, Kalashnikov rifles, firing live rounds over your head. And then down there, you have these Jewish boys just got out of high school, and you wouldn't believe what they do. The day before they do this, they take them to the military's version of Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Memorial. And they show them pictures of the medical experiments on Jewish children done at Dachau. And they show terrible pictures of what the Nazis did to Jewish children and to old ladies and things like that. The sergeants <laughs> have a profile on each candidate to be a paratrooper or whatever unit they're going into. And they don't call you private or anything. They call you by your name, Danny, Donnie. And they know Donnie has a little sister named Rachel, Rachel. And they show him the picture. You see that? That's what he's going to do to your baby sister, Rachel. Do you love your baby sister? You better get up there and kill him before he kills you. But before he kills you, this is what he's going to do to your little sister. They tell him stuff like that. And they scream, they're going to kill, don't you understand? And they show them a map of all these Arab countries surrounding Israel and how little it is. You can't afford to lose one war. Don't you get it? And they keep telling them that they're psyching them up. The whole thing with the Holocaust, and they keep psyching them up like this. And you get this kid, if he doesn't get up the first day, he's got to get up the second. <laughs> and if he doesn't get up, he doesn't go into Kravi. And then they're shooting them, the AK 47s, and I'm telling you. <laughs> Unbelievable. I knew a guy who had been an American Marine and went through Paris Island. And I asked him which was more difficult Paris Island or this Kavi. And he said, from the point of view of people screaming at you and making you polish your shoes, and March Correct, Paris Island, the continuous, from the point of view of the actual physical and combat training, he said it was much harder in the IDF, much harder. I'm not saying every soldier goes through it, but the ones who go on Kravi have to do this. You can't get into the Golani Brigade or be a paratrooper or anything, you know, a serious fighter, unless you do this. And, and, and screaming at them. And these kids begin working out in high school and going to special youth brigades called Gadna, training to be able to do this before they get there. It's wild. The best way to train somebody is hit them with the reality. 
pictures of the Holocaust, graphic images, people shooting live rounds, actual chlorine gas canisters going off in your face, <laughs> getting an electric shock and cut by razor wire with it, that gives you a shock. I mean, you get up there and you're screaming. And you're... Unbelievable. But it's true. What we read is tribulation brings about perseverance. We also exult in our tribulation. The stuff we go through now is preparation for the real thing. That's not to say the tribulation we have now is not real. But I see the tribulations Christians have in California, and things are getting tougher with Proposition 8, and I can't send my kids to the public school anymore because of this, and, uh, you know, uh, I'm a Christian policeman, and I have to go to this gay sensitivity training, and it's all against my beliefs, and, you know, this is happening. It's getting very difficult for Christians in the legal teaching and professions and the emergency services. You know, <laughs> Fighters in the military having to go to gay sensitivity training. This is crazy. Our enemies don't do that. They guarantee the Iranians don't have that. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. But uh, I have to go to Vietnam in November. There's no comparison, not by a long shot, between anything any Christian in this country goes through and what those people, especially their pastors, go through as a way of life. They've got the real thing. I don't think many Christians in America could handle what they go through because Christians in America have been lied to so much by TBN and by the money preachers, by the messengers of Satan. You don't have to suffer, you're a king's kid. Blab it and grab it. Claim the victory in Jesus. So you don't have any faith. <laughs> they don't even know what faith is. They're not teaching, again, faith in Jesus. They're teaching faith in faith. I've seen real persecution. I've seen the real persecuted church. It's not, it's, it's, there's no comparison. I know that those people can stand. Now be careful of these deceivers who are saying, we're going to be raptured out of here, we're not going to be persecuted. This is just people reinterpreting scripture in light of their Western freedom that is quickly disappearing anyway. But let's look. Romans chapter 5, verse Four, perseverance, hoopamony, proven character, and proven character, hope. Hope, the blessed hope. You will not have or be able to have the blessed hope unless your character has been proven. <laughs> you see that? You can't have the blessed hope unless your character has been proven. But your character cannot be proven until you've learned to persevere, hearken. And hearken in tribulation. <laughs> Nothing in the scripture supports this pre-trib stuff. You got a free ticket out of here, don't worry about it. They have made the blessed hope, the rapture. We are told in the same chapter that speaks, same book that speaks of the blessed hope, that when a believer dies, we are not to mourn overly in the way that those who have no hope do. The blessed hope is not the rapture. The blessed hope is the return of Jesus whether by rapture or by resurrection. 
whether by Anastasia or by Harpezo, it's the parousia, that's the blessed hope, his return, the Episunagage, are gathering together with him. They have foolishly, recklessly, irresponsibly, and without any grammatical or linguistic mandate to do it whatsoever, redefined the blessed hope as the pre-trib rapture. Complete nonsense. Same as the Calvinists, without any linguistic or grammatical or exegetical basis, have redefined perseverance of the saints as unconditional, once saved, always saved. They just redefine these things. But I suppose many Christians have inadvertently redefined perseverance as steadfastness. <laughs> That's not what it is. You cannot have this hope without a proven character. He's changing us from glory to glory. And the way he does this is by getting us to hearken, to persevere. But the way he really gets us to hearken is through tribulations. You have tribulation in the world. He's dealing with our old nature, and he's training us up to confront things that are going to come, particularly in the last days. That's why he lets it happen. Those drill instructors in the IDF aren't putting those young recruits through that just because they like to see these young people get electric shocks and get cut with razor wire and <laughs> risk of, of heat stroke. They're doing it because they know it is going to prepare them for something. That being able to go through that may save their lives in a future situation. Well, let's continue. Look with me, please, to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. And in your knowledge, self-control, ikrete, and in your ikrete, self-control, which Paul says is the fruit of the Spirit, again, when you see these people, these counterfeit revivals in Lakeland and Toronto and all this nonsense in Pensacola out of control, that is not the fruit of the Spirit, it is therefore not the Holy Spirit. In your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness. When you see people who lack self-control, it means they're not hearkening. They're not listening to Jesus. If people were listening to Jesus, they'd know that those deceptions were counterfeit revivals, wouldn't they? If they were really persevering, they would know that Pensacola needs these impacts of lies. Well, let's continue looking further. Look at 1 John chapter 2, please. Something about the last days. When he gets to verse 18, he speaks about Antichrist in the last hour. Now we explain what this means in the book Shadows of the Beast and also on our teaching on um, Antichrist, the Antichrist series. Do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And it describes what the world is and its lusts and so forth. Then it says, children, it's the last hour. <laughs> People who love the world and the things of the world are not going to be ready to confront the reality of Antichrist in the last days. I have warned repeatedly, and do so at every appropriate opportunity. Almost every deception of Satan aimed at the church in the Western world today, if you have not heard me say it 500 times, you need to hear it at least 500 times. Every deception virtually of Satan aimed at the church in the Western world today is to seduce us into trusting in this life or this world. Kingdom now theology, dominionism, postmillennialism, word faith, blab it and grab it. 
New Apostolic Reformation. All that stuff has one common ingredient. Trusting in this world. Hoping in this world. Now again, what's really odd is Satan then raises up another deception that appears to be its opposite. <laughs> the emergent church emula emulates early medieval monasticism <laughs> with, with, the, with the incense and the labyrinths and the Lectio Divina and the prayer walks and all this kind of stuff, the, the mysticism. All sensual experience is a form of spirituality where you separate yourself from the world as the Desert Fathers did and go into this labyrinth. And they, they, they emulate monasticism. It's weird. He gets two things, you know. He always does that. The Lord made them male and female and said it was good. Therefore, sexual immorality is wrong. So what Satan does, what does Paul say in Timothy? Teaching doctrines of demons, forbidding marriage, the celibacy of the Roman Catholic Church. It seems to be the opposite, but they're both works of Satan. <laughs> now you're saved, now you're not, to facilitate the sale of indulgences, to build the Vatican. That was Roman Catholicism. Calvinism, unconditional, once saved, always saved. That seems to be the opposite, but they're both lies of the devil. The devil is really great at getting one thing that's wrong, and people see it's wrong. Once they become aware it's wrong, he raises up something that seems to be the opposite of it. You know how many Christians today are going into Calvinism and Reformed theology? I hate to say anything good about him, but he certainly knows his business. He's been at it a long time. And what really frustrates me are the same con jobs he pulled on Israel and the Jews he uses against the church with considerable success. Well, it's quite a thing. Look with me, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. I know a man in Christ... Fourteen years ago, whether in the body I do not know or out of the body I do not know, God knows such a man was harpezod, literally raptured. Don't let anybody tell you that we don't know what it's going to be like when we're raptured. We do know. It's going to be what happened to John in Revelation chapter 4.1. It's going to be what Paul's describing here in 2 Corinthians. Okay. But before this happened to Paul, he went through substantial trials, didn't he? Through tribulation. In Damascus, he had to get out of town quick. Before we can handle these things, we have to learn to persevere. Now, Let's go further with this. In the last days. But look with me to Revelation chapter 1, verse 9. I know your tribulation, Philipsis, and your poverty, but you are rich, and the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews, the false brethren, and so on, but are a synagogue of Satan. And he goes on saying, Satan's going to put you in prison. And you'll have tribulation 10 days, and then you'll get a crown of life. Verse 11, he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. How do you overcome persecution? Not by being steadfast. By hearkening. If you're hearkening, steadfastness is a given. Steadfastness will be automatic. Do not fall into the trap of focusing on being steadfast on its own. It'll fail you unless you are hearkening. If you are hearkening, then be steadfast. 
Well, let's look. Revelation 1 9, I know your brother, I, John, your brother, fellow partaker in the tribulation, the, the, the ellipsis, and kingdom, and hoopamony, perseverance. Right there, a relationship between tribulation and hearkening. Perseverance. Revelation chapter 2, verse 2. I know your deeds, your toil, and your steadfastness. No. And your perseverance. Then comes the steadfastness in the Greek text. Revelation chapter 2, verse 19. Tells the church in Thyatira, a bad church, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at the first. Notice if somebody's really persevering, they're going to be faithful. The deeds will be there. The works will be there. If you don't see the works, they're not being faithful. They're not persevering. Because if you're persevering, that is your hearkening, Jesus is going to be telling you by his spirit, do this, do that. Go here, go there. Don't do this, don't do that, do this. Here's what I want you to do. Here's your gift, here's your ministry, here's your function in the body. This is what you got to do. You're only going to know what Jesus wants you to do by hearkening, by persevering. You get people, I don't know what to do with my life. I don't know what the Lord's calling me to do. Should I be married? Should I be single? Should I go into full-time ministry? Should I go to university or to Bible college or seminary? Or should I do this? Should we go to the mission field? Or should I do this? Da, 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 da. <laughs> they think that the preacher has a crystal ball under his table. <laughs> If you're persevering, what God's calling you to do is going to become apparent. Not only to you, but to those who know you, at least within the body of Christ. It's going to be apparent. Let's continue. Revelation chapter 2. Now let's look at chapter 3 of Revelation, verse 10. Because you've kept the word of my perseverance. Notice the relationship between the word, the scripture, and perseverance. The first and foremost way God speaks to us is always on the basis of his word. He will never tell us to do anything that is not in accordance with his word. Notice it puts the word first. Unless somebody has a grasp of basic doctrine, they're not going to understand how to hearken. This is particularly true of young believers and sometimes of women. Not that I'm a misogynist. It's not true of all women. But women are more naturally prone to it than men. Men have other problems, which are just as uh, the, decrepit. <laughs> Thinking that you're hearing from the Lord when you're not. <laughs> Thinking of hearing from the Lord when you are not. Women are, on the average, more vulnerable to that than men are. That is one of the reasons leadership is male. It is a protective function. Okay. Unless you're grounded in the word, you cannot persevere because you will not know it's Jesus holding you and speaking to you. <laughs> the word of my perseverance I'll keep you from the hour of testing, Pedesmos. You're not going to go into the wrath of God, the day of the Lord. We're out of here for that. We're not going to be here for that. Providing you're persevering. <laughs> and you can't persevere unless you're grounded in God's word. When you see people going around, we just have to be led of the Lord and led of his spirit. And all that. 
They're talking a lot of rubbish. They're hearing the voice of other spirits. They're being misled by what Jeremiah calls the futility and foolishness of their own mind. That's not perseverance. Perseverance requires a grounding in the word. Remember, my people perish for lack of knowledge. When we begin looking at this subject in Romans, which deals a lot with the issue of perseverance, and in the book of Revelation, which deals a lot with the issue of perseverance, they deal the most with the subject of perseverance than any other two books of Scripture. Romans and Revelation. You've got references to it in other epistles and in Peter and so forth, but it is a recurrent theme. It is a cardinal feature of Romans, and it is a recurrent theme, a cardinal feature of Revelation. What it is saying is this. The believers who will remain faithful in the last days, who will persevere in the last days, are the ones who have always been faithful and persevered day to day in ordinary life. Those who have been faithful day to day and persevered in ordinary life will be the ones who will be able to stand and to escape the paresmos, the wrath to come, the hour of testing. Because you've already passed the test. You've already, if you've persevered, you've already passed the test. You already passed it. You have to take it again. It's like when I was in university, it was five tests. If you got four A's, you didn't have to take the fifth. It was an option to take the fifth test. <laughs> As only your top four grades counted. Now, students who wanted to go on to postgraduate or something, they would take it optionally, usually, but you, they didn't have to. They had their A. They didn't have to worry about the final exam. They were exempted from because they had to. Had to do. But that was the way it is. You've already persevered. Now, this idea of perseverance has been true of all believers at all times. But the fact that the only other book of the Bible that puts as much emphasis on it as Romans, and actually puts more emphasis on it than Romans, verse for verse, is Revelation. In other words, it is what we call a Calva Homer situation. I won't explain that now. But a general truth becomes an amplified truth, okay? Something always important becomes especially important in the last days. As I've explained it many times, Hebrews 10, 25, forsake not the fellowshipping together one with another, especially as you see the day approaching. Fellowship is always important, but in the last days, it's important becomes amplified, okay? Well, it's the same thing. Perseverance is always important. But in the last days, its importance becomes amplified. It becomes a key to survival. Well, if somebody is not grounded in Scripture, they are not going to persevere. Okay? They're not going to persevere. Not going to persevere. If someone is not practicing ikrete, they're not going to persevere. They're not going to persevere. They're not going to have the character to persevere. If someone is mistakenly thinking that perseverance is steadfastness, they're not going to persevere. <laughs> they're not going to persevere. If you persevere, you will be steadfast. But endeavoring to be steadfast is not going to make you persevere. <laughs> I'll say that again. Persevering will guarantee steadfastness, but steadfastness will not guarantee perseverance by any means. Look, look, look at the cults. They, they're very steadfast. This doesn't work that way. 
in the last days, believers are having problems. It will come to the Western world. It is already in many countries. It's just that the corruption of our government and the mammon worship of Western society causes our corrupt governments to ignore the plight of Christians in other countries. Well, if somebody insults Islam, the religion who's persecuting them, that becomes front page news. Again, this is all Satan's working. Uh, what's happening to believers in the countries I go to, sometimes, uh, and I've been to other countries with this persecution, both Islamic and communist, uh, those people are a lot more equipped to stand in the face of what's coming on the face of the earth than we are. I've known pastors in Southeast Asia that they only wanted Jesus to come because they didn't have any other way out of it. Now I'm going to tell you something that's true, that's sad, and it's sick. And I have rarely been more angry in my life. I was doing a pastor seminar secretly. And they asked me, these are simple people now, true story, why didn't Jesus come on a certain date as Brother Camping said he would? They got the shortwave thing of camping in, in their language. And they all went to some mountain thinking that Jesus was going to come. And the communist police came and they killed over 100 of them. These people lost family. They listened to this guy from California. And it wasn't the first time he did something like that. But we shouldn't judge. We shouldn't criticize. We should just let him get people killed. You know, we don't want to be critical now. So what if he's getting people killed? Unnecessary. Anyway, they were so desperate for Jesus to come because they're being persecuted. <laughs> Remember, in the last days, the church gets so worldly that persecution becomes a necessary evil. Now, unfortunately, it's the ones who don't need to be persecuted who tend to get it first and worst. But it certainly separates the genuine articles from the TBN supporters. <laughs> it separates the followers of Jesus from the followers of Kenny, Benny, and Joyce. Perseverance goes hand in hand with faith. Faith is inseparable from faithfulness. They are the same term in both biblical languages. Same term. Steadfastness, yeah, we're encouraged to be steadfast. But that can't be the emphasis. The emphasis has to be hearkening. The more we hearken to the voice of the Holy Spirit, the more we walk with Jesus on the basis of his word, the more we persevere on the basis of his word, the more steadfast we're going to become. That will become evident in both our character and it will become evident in our faith and our faithfulness. That is the real meaning of perseverance of the saints. When things get tough, remember, the Lord is allowing that to happen. To prepare us for what lies ahead. Even if we don't experience it personally, to groom the next generation, if there is one, something. perseverance. He uses the lipsis, tribulation, to build us up in perseverance. Perseverance must must be grounded in the doctrines of Scripture. 
and perseverance must not be confused with steadfastness. Be steadfast, yes. But if we're persevering, we are going to be steadfast anyway. If we are persevering, we are going to be faithful anyway. If we are persevering, hearken, hearken. If you walk with them now, you'll walk with them when things get tough. And when you walk with them when things get tough, you'll walk with them when things get tougher. And if you walk with them when things get tougher, you'll be out of here before they get really tough. <laughs> that is perseverance. God bless.